The horrors of war have led to some of the most extreme situations human beings have ever endured. Beyond the concepts of right and wrong, justice and revenge, cowardice and heroism, we see, time and time again, the incredible spirit of the human being when placed in the most horrific positions imaginable. It's easy to focus on the actions of nations and governments, but as always when viewing history, we must look for the human element, the simple reality that for most, the war and the politics of their nation wasn't something they had any say in. Caught in the gears of history, people on all sides have demonstrated unbelievable heroism and martial prowess. In today's episode of the Wars of the World's Deadliest Combatant series, we're looking at some of the most notable soldiers of the fascist Axis power of Italy and the nation of Finland, who found herself caught in the curious position of fighting both with and against the Nazis throughout the Second World War. These are the deadliest Italian and Finnish combatants of World War II. Had events in Germany in 1933 gone even a little differently, it is wholly possible that World War II would have begun with war breaking out between Britain and France and Italy. In 1925, Italy fell under the grip of fascist dictator Mussolini, who wanted to build a new Italian empire. He undertook a rapid military expansion program and pursued an aggressive foreign policy, particularly in Africa. In 1936, Mussolini and Hitler signed the first treaty that would bring the two fascist countries closer together. Mussolini declared later that all other European countries would from then on rotate on the Rome-Berlin axis, and this in turn created the term the Axis Powers to identify Nazi Germany and its allies. Joining in the war on the side of Germany, Mussolini's Italy fought bitter campaigns against the British in North Africa and Greece in the Aegean Sea. In both campaigns, the Italians performed relatively poorly and had to be rescued by German forces. Losing North Africa in 1943, Italy itself was soon invaded by the Allies and Mussolini was ousted, only to be freed in a German special operation. With the Italian government now siding with the Allies, while the remaining fascists continued behind Mussolini and Hitler, Italians found themselves fighting each other until the fighting ended on May 2nd, 1945, by which time Mussolini had been killed. Despite the shortcomings of both the Italian military and the industrial complex supporting it, it was the courage and ingenuity of the men at the front that would give Italy the successes she did achieve. A case typifying this can be found with Luigi Pascucci. Very little is known about Pascucci's early life, other than he was born on October 30th, 1909, and that after joining the Italian army, he served in Italy's tank force, fighting in North Africa against the British and Commonwealth forces. Pascucci's unit was equipped with the Fiat M1340 tank, which was effective in the first year of the war, but was quickly becoming obsolete particularly with the arrival of the American-made tanks such as the M3 Grant and the M4 Sherman being supplied to the British. On November 4th, 1942, Pascucci led his armored company during the critical Second Battle of El Alamein. Despite more advanced anti-tank rounds for his 40mm gun, the British Shermans with their 75mm guns caused immense damage to the Italians, forcing them to retreat. Despite finding themselves at a technical disadvantage, Pascucci was ordered to hold the Italian left flank against the British 8th Armoured Brigade long enough to allow the main Italian force to escape, a task in which he succeeded, but this left his unit separated and about to be encircled. Rather than surrender, he ordered his unit to launch a daring attack on the British, if only to keep buying their comrades more time. 
It was a last ditch effort, but it worked, disrupting the cohesion of the British advance, but at a cost. Four hours later, his body was discovered in the wreck of his tank. Recognizing his selfless actions, Luigi Pascucci was posthumously awarded Italy's highest award for bravery. At sea, the Italian Navy's effectiveness was severely blunted early in the war by a surprise attack by British torpedo planes on the base at Taranto. However, this attack predominantly afflicted the surface fleet. Italy's submarine fleet, however, was a very real threat to the Allies, and while not achieving the level of notoriety as their German counterparts, they inflicted heavy damage on the Allies, and by far the most successful submariner was Lieutenant Gianfranco Gazzana Prioroggia. Throughout the war, Gianfranco served on several submarines. Initially, he served on the submarine Enrico Tazzoli as the second in command before he was appointed as the captain of the Archimede, but it was while he commanded the submarine Leonardo da Vinci that he would achieve his greatest success. Beginning on June 28, 1941, Gianfranco and the crew of the Da Vinci would go on to achieve significant results against Allied shipping. Perhaps the Da Vinci's most notable success was the sinking of the 21,517-ton RMS Empress of Canada. On March 13, 1943, the requisition liner was en route from South Africa when the Da Vinci spotted the vessel. Gianfranco couldn't have known that on board were a large number of Italian prisoners of war, along with Polish and Greek refugees, when he torpedoed the ship at midnight, approximately 400 miles south of Cape Palmas, off the coast of Africa. Of the approximate 1,800 people on board, 392 died, nearly half of which were Italian prisoners. On May 23, 1943, Gianfranco and his men were returning from another successful patrol, during which he had earned a battlefield promotion to the rank of Captino de Corvette when they were attacked by the British warships HMS Active and HMS Ness. The British ships subjected the Italian submarine to an intense and powerful depth charge attack, from which there was no escape, and the Leonardo da Vinci was sunk approximately 300 miles west of Vigo, Spain. For his combat service, Gianfranco was posthumously awarded the Gold Medal of Military Valor and Germany's prestigious Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross. Submariners traditionally rate their success on the gross tonnage sunk rather than the number of ships sunk, and being responsible for sinking more than 120,000 tons of Allied shipping, Gianfranco's record surpasses any Allied commander's score and both he and the Leonardo da Vinci were the most successful non-German submariner and submarine of World War II. Finally, we come to Alfredo Carpanetto. Carpanetto was born in Rome to an Italian father and Austrian mother, but would spend much of his life in Austria, which was annexed by Nazi Germany in 1938. Living as an Austrian, he was drafted into the German army upon the outbreak of war, and is such technically a German soldier, although his father's nationality qualifies him for an entry here. Joining Germany's elite Panzer Corps, he served as part of a tank crew during the Battle for France, and then again during the invasion of the Soviet Union in 1941. Finally, in March 1944, he was given command of his own Tiger tank, and the young commander would quickly make a name for himself in combat with the Soviets, who were by then charging across Eastern Europe towards Germany. Accumulating an incredible tally of at least 50 Soviet tanks confirmed destroyed, his prowess was dramatically demonstrated in an engagement on October 10th, 1944. Carpanetto and his crew found themselves separated from their unit and facing down no less than 13 Soviet tanks that were attempting to encircle a nearby Panzer regiment. Despite being outnumbered 13 to 1, the Austro-Italian tank commander fired the Tiger's deadly 88mm gun at the enemy and proceeded to destroy four Soviet T-34s in quick succession, causing the remaining nine to retreat in disarray. If you're a fan of one man against the world stories where the one man wins, they don't come much better than that. Despite this victory, the Soviets continued to push on to Berlin, and Carbonetta was killed in combat on January 26th, 1945.
In August of 1939, Germany and the Soviet Union agreed a non-aggression pact that was aimed at keeping the two expanding powers from coming into conflict with one another. During negotiations, both sides agreed to draw a line down Eastern Europe and promised not to interfere in the other's areas of interest. This freed Germany to invade Poland and allowed the Soviet Union to invade Finland. Dubbed the Winter War, this brief but bloody conflict is an often overlooked chapter in the early story of World War II that would significantly affect events later. On paper at least, the Soviet Union should have crushed Finland. However, inept Soviet military leadership pitted against the tenacious and competent Finnish troops meant that the war ground to a slog which cost the Soviets a heavy toll in lives. A peace agreement was reached by March 13th, 1940, which saw Finland cede some territory to the Soviets but remain an independent nation. However, neither side was satisfied and war soon loomed again. After desperately failing to garner help from Britain and Sweden, Finland had little choice but to turn to the Germans, who agreed on the condition that German troops could use the country as a staging post for the invasion of the Soviet Union in 1941. This meant that when the Germans did invade, the Finnish would be at war again. Finnish troops continued to demonstrate their prowess against the Soviets, but in the larger context of the Second World War, it meant Finland was now an enemy of the Allies, and British bombers raided the country several times in support of the Soviets. Many Finnish historians argue that siding with Nazi Germany was a simple act of necessity to secure Finland's protection, and while this paid off initially, by 1944, it was becoming increasingly clear that Germany would lose the war, and Finland could expect harsh punishments from the Soviets. The Allies were calling for Finland to disassociate itself from Nazi Germany, and with the Soviets more preoccupied with capturing Berlin before the Western Allies, they agreed a peace with Finland on September 4th, 1944. Now, Finland was an enemy of Nazi Germany, and the peace with Moscow sparked the Lapland War. Lapland was of strategic interest to Germany, as the region was rich with nickel mines in the Petsamo area. Around 1,000 Finns and 2,000 Germans perished in the fight before the last Germans were expelled in April 1945. Finland had succeeded again in maintaining her independence, but in the post-war peace had to cede nearly 10% of her territory, including her fourth largest city, to the Soviet Union and pay war reparations to Moscow. Given the fearsome reputation Finland's troops garnered between 1939 and 1945, it should come as little surprise that many of her troops earned themselves places in the annals of military history. One such soldier was Simo Hauha, who would terrorize Soviet troops in the snow-covered forests of Finland to such an extent that he became known as the White Death. During one 35-day period of combat, it was reported that he had killed up to 61 enemy troops, mostly with his sniper rifle, although he was equally proficient with a submachine gun in close quarters combat. Accounts of Simo's exploits vary, and research often produces conflicting results, but most historians agree that his final tally in the Winter War alone was in excess of 500 kills, making him the most successful sniper in the entire of recorded history. On March 6th, 1940, he was wounded in the face by a Soviet explosive bullet, but survived and was taken to hospital. During his recovery, he was shocked to find newspapers reporting his death, and he quickly wrote to them to correct the mistake. Despite his desire to continue the fight against the Soviets in 1941, the Finnish army elected to keep him off the front lines due to his injury. Had he been allowed back to the front, we can only imagine how many more men would have fallen to the deadliest sniper the world has ever seen. Like all countries during the war, Finland had its share of colorful heroes, and one such soldier was Arnd Jutalainen. Training to become an officer in the Finnish army in the late 20s, his lifestyle, which involved heavy drinking, was considered unbefitting of an officer, and he was forced to leave the service in 1928 before finding his way to the French Foreign Legion. Fighting Berber rebels in Morocco, when he answered his country's call to defend against the Soviets, he had earned the title, The Terror of Morocco. 
Fighting at the Battle of Kolar, a general asked his men if the Finns would hold the river. Deutalainen responded that they would hold it until he ordered them to run. This demonstrated the spirit of resistance amongst the Finns, which was often referred to as the Kolar spirit afterwards. Deutalainen went to war again alongside Germany in 1941, and he garnered an impressive reputation for level-headedness under fire. Sadly, however, alcoholism began to overtake him, and this saw him punished by being assigned to a unit handling prisoners of war, although it was short-lived and he was soon back to the fight. In late 1944, he joined the fight against the Germans in Lapland, but with the end of the war in sight, he was again encouraged to resign from the army by his commanders. However, like many families in Finland, Arne was by no means the only member of the Jutalainen family to fight, and his brother, Ilmari Jutalainen, was also putting the family name amongst some of the best fighter pilots in history. Joining the Finnish Air Force in 1932, he was flying Fokker 21s when he scored his first kill, a Soviet DB-3 bomber in this aircraft. By the time the Germans invaded the Soviet Union, he was flying the barrel-like Brewster Buffalo that was devastating against the poor quality Soviet aircraft and pilots of 1941. Flying the Buffalo, he would claim 34 Soviet aircraft, but as the Soviets began re-equipping with newer types, so did Finland, and he soon found himself behind the controls of a German-built Messerschmitt Bf109G, one of the world's premier fighters. In this formidable aircraft, he shot down six Soviet aircraft in a single day on June 30th, 1940. On September 3rd, just over two weeks before the Finns and Soviets made peace, he shot down his last Soviet aircraft. It was his 94th victory, which makes him the highest scoring non-German ace of World War II. And there you have the most notable and deadliest Italian and Finnish soldiers of World War II. Please leave a comment down below with your own thoughts, and remember to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.